Trasnet is a project that's got many faces, and here we'll just come back a little bit and talk about cities. And one thing we often kind of forget about it once we're so deep into the project is that a lot of people live in cities, like, and more and more. And this has become sometimes a problem because small cities don't always have the money to make the whole city smart and to put sensors and all the things we want to do there. And it's not just in the UK, it's in a lot of places. And it's costly to have all the sensors and to have sensors and sensors to have all the stuff. It's costly and it causes sometimes trouble. Like sometimes you have to wait with your car because someone is estimating how many cars are there on the street. That is how data is normally or has been collected until recently and still it's never enough data. While at the same time we know that today we are in this data deluge, avalanche or whatever your favorite term is. And we have to somehow, somehow go from not having money sometimes to gather the data to using all this data we have and try to be smart about it. And well, here's a little slide just mentioning that problem that we typically face. But I'll just jump to the solutions that we've, we've been discussing here. Smarter cities, doing all that, deploying sensors and data. But what we talk about in Transnet is about the sensors that we carry in our pockets. Everyone here is carrying, well, most of us, I guess, will have a mobile device, and that has a lot of data. How can a researcher use all that stuff without breaching into anyone's private life, use that to improve traffic in a city? How can a city use that from its own citizens? And we all know we have now a lot of apps that track us in many different ways. Well, we've got a little paper from a couple of years ago where we were trying to use Twitter data to see if you can estimate traffic. So simply assuming the, the very simple thing of where you have more people, you have more people going there. And that's actually connected to one of the most famous models for traffic that is the one that Alan mentioned in the beginning, well, the gravity model, and I'll go to it in a second. Transnet here, it's got a couple different sub-projects. I'll be focusing on a single one, but if you want to talk more about it, we can talk more about it later. We've got some visual analytics tools that we're developing for people that want to visualize their data quickly, not necessarily urban data or traffic data, but any .csv or .excel file that people want to visualize without having access to like a big fancy tool or to someone who can code. So that's one branch of the project. Another one is trying to see if we can look at incidents of traffic delay and disruption using data that's open and available. And in fact, without knowing anything about the traffic itself, can you estimate traffic based on what you find in a city? I mean, I know that there'll be more traffic around a school or around um, a church or something, but can you actually put a number on that? What's causing more incidents? Where, do you, where are you gonna have a car crash? We can talk more about those. Right now, I'll be focusing on the task, the simple task of a mobility model to predict and to understand how many people go from a place to another. That's the basic task. And there's this big difference between predicting and understanding. Because once you build a very big simulation that can actually, to, down to the digits, say how many people are going from A to B, that still, from there to actually knowing why, there's a bit of a step. And the why is very important, as you also in the, in the former talk, because sometimes you want to predict the outcome of a different event. What if I add a new school here or, or a parking lot there? Do I know what that's going to cause? Otherwise, you'll just keep kind of making a little film of your own city. So we're on that task, trying to understand the why. And here's the gravity model that has a little story connected to the Turing now. And basically, it's a model that works really well when you're at a country level. If you're talking about something at the scale of London, it's still fine. It works in places like London and Paris. But once you go smaller, once you talk about a local authority or a small city, then some models like this one start sort of breaking down. Here's a paper that proposed an extension to the gravity model. In fact, a very big modification in it. It was called the radiation model. It worked on another model called the intervening opportunities model. But basically what they did is that the authors of this paper, they took two pairs of counties in the United States, here like Davis and Washington County, <coughs> Madison and Houston County, and they saw, well, these two pairs of counties, they have the same population of origin and destination. They're about to have the same distance. 
but the traffic going from one to the other or the number of people going from one to the other is very different. So whatever is causing this at this national scale must be beyond simply how many people live there and the distance between places. Well, not surprisingly, it was about the number of things between one, one place and another. If I'm going to leave the touring right now to f try to find a place to eat, I'll just stop whenever I find something to eat. So if you're living in a place where there's a lot of things around you, maybe you don't need to go that far. That was the essence of the radiation model. And yeah, it worked pretty well. People extended it later to try to deal with smaller and smaller places. And uh, that's just on the top of the, the formula that they came to, but I'll go back to it later. And this is a model that works like super nicely. The first one didn't even have any parameters to fit. It was beautiful, beautiful understanding of a macro scale behavior. What makes people go from A to B? Awesome. But it doesn't really work when you go to a small place. This is Oxfordshire, the, the city of Oxford is just in this kind of tiny circle here. And well, when you're at a scale like this, this size, you cannot just use how many people live in a place to predict how many people are going there. This is an example of some electoral wards. You can just think of them as neighborhoods. And the number of people that go from pink to blue is about three times as much as the number of people that go from pink to green. But the population is the same. The number of opportunities measured by basically the number of people living between A and B are about the same. So what's the difference again between pink and green and pink and blue? There's a sort of an analogy to what I showed about the radiation model. Again, here's a point where the models that we use to predict traffic and specifically to predict commuting, they break. So what's going on? There's something that these models are missing and it's at this point, it's not just give it more data because the model doesn't know what to do with that data. Right now, these models only take distance and how many people live in a certain place in the map, I guess. So part of our work is to now try to figure out, right, what's missing? How can we actually tell how many people are going to go from Botley to the Thames Ward in a month? And here comes a way to try to incorporate some data. We're using the OpenStreetMap which if you don't know, you should really check it out. It's basically Wikipedia for maps. If you look there, it's a lot of volunteers that create this website. They say, well, in this place, there's a library called the British Library, that's it. And it's, I think in Canada, if I'm not mistaken, there are even trees in that map. And it's all open, all available. And here is a picture of Oxford, Oxfordshire. Here's about 10% of the OpenStreetMap dots that we have there. Every color represents a different category of offices and shops and this and that. And on the right here, we've got a central neighborhood. And you can definitely see there's a lot going on there, much more than just how many people live there. And that's when your hypothesis starts to kind of form in your head. Sure, the number of people going from A to B might really depend on the things we have inside A and B. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but well, this one here, the blue one, is very urban, whereas the other one Incidentally, it's very green. It's a very scenic place. So the reasons people go from one to the other are quite different. So I guess maybe that's what's causing the bigger traffic going to one place. Can we somehow incorporate that into the model? Can we make a model that's sort of cheap like this? I'm using open data. I'm using basically one formula and some demographic data from the Office of National Statistics. Can I use that to predict traffic? Because if it works, I could apply this to any place as long as I have demographic data and a map. Well, I tried a variety of models, some of the ones we've described here, and they all only incorporate these things I've described, except that they don't incorporate the OpenStreetMap data. So I then tried to modify them in kind of very, very naive ways. Maybe I replace the population that lives in a place by some combination, the linear combination of all the things in the open street maps there. So number of shops, number of houses, number of buildings, and all these very naive things produce an awful result. These things were meant to lie on the diagonal, and they're not lying on the diagonal. Here on the y-axis, you've got data, which is from, mo from mobile phones, from GPS data. It's all anonymized and aggregated, so rather than knowing where a single person went. I just know how many people went from blue to pink or whatever, from A to B in a month, and that's all I know. 
And on the x-axis here, you've got the prediction. And they all fail miserably. So really, there is something which is not just having more data there. There's something about the mechanism that we're missing. And that's a point where you really need to think about how you're predicting things. Here's just a small snapshot of what our error is looking like. On the y-axis, you've got the prediction divided by the data. On the x-axis, you've got the origin population. And all I want to show you here is that there is a big bunch of blue blobs here. They represent trips with a very high volume. And they're all at the same place. High origin population. And they're very underestimated. There's something about these trips that seem to leave from very densely populated places that just makes them underestimated, completely underestimated. And I can tell that if I simply removed them from my data set, the parameter fitting would just tilt this thing until everything is predicted quite well. So the model's trying to kind of overfit one thing, underfit the other, and then nothing really works. And, and at this point in the project, we're really trying to kind of dissect this, these errors, see like where are we getting it wrong? So I decided to just make a similar plot with the x-axis being every variable that I could think of. I made a lot of them, but the bottom line is the following. Here the first one is the one I just showed you, and the others have the origin, the destination population, land use, which is roughly green spaces, scenicness, which is again a measure of roughly green spaces, and the distance in the SIJ, which is the number of opportunities between A and B for a given trip. What we find from summarizing this figure is that the trips we're underestimating, those big blue blobs, they are from highly populated places to highly populated places where both are very urban, really low in green areas, and they're close, and there's not a lot of things in between them. So really, like in a city. Maybe it could be that differently from going from Manchester to Liverpool or to London, I can actually go from home to work and back a couple times in a day especially if I'm living in a place as small as Oxford, I can definitely cycle or take a bus, but I cannot do that at a country level. This is just my guess, but it's, there's definitely something about these trips that we're just not capturing at all. So the next steps of the project are to try to see what's going on, first to sort of develop this diagnosis in a way that people could apply that to other models, but then to fix them, not just by adding more data, but perhaps by changing the mechanisms in the model. That's where we are right now, and thank you for your attention. I'll just skip this.